My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the lab and I am joined this morning by our curator Brian Jones and we are going to chat about um, the diversity of crabs in our local area because I think that people are familiar with a handful of our local crabs maybe ghost crabs maybe fiddler crabs some people um, blue crabs and, and maybe a couple of others, people might be familiar with stone crabs and maybe they're not aware that they are found in Alabama. Um, but Brian and I have been collecting crabs uh, for 20, 25 years in this area. And so we sat down yesterday and tried to compile a list of all of the crabs that we know to have been found in Alabama. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's not a, a, an existing resource that somebody have, has definitively cataloged um, all of a, a group of animals uh, for a particular geographic location. So Brian and I came up with a list of 29 different species that we know to have been found in Alabama. Um, and then we sent that out to some of our colleagues who um, have also spent a good bit of time collecting in this area and who might have been able to contribute to that list. So um, uh, Trace Bierman, one of our researchers here, added a, added a handful to that list that he has caught in trawls offshore. Um, so if we talk about just Alabama, we're talking about the Alabama coastline, including Dauphin Island, uh, Fort Morgan Peninsula to Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, um, but then offshore as well up to uh, nine miles. And so the list that Trey added to might have been slightly outside of that nine mile zone, but um, you know, not, not too far away from the Alabama coast. So I think Trey added up to 41, not added 41, added up to the number 41 total. Um, so we have a pretty big diversity of crabs in our local area, um, many of which people are completely unaware of. So Brian and I went out yesterday afternoon and this morning, we caught some live crabs and we rounded up um, some crabs that we have kind of in tanks in different places around the lab. Um, we pulled some from our education um, Classrooms are classrooms that have tanks in them. We pulled some from uh, one of our grad students' research project um, who's, who's working on crabs. We pulled some from, our, um, from the aquarium, and we pulled some preserved specimens and some molts, which we'll, we'll explain a little bit um, as we go through. But we didn't, uh, we didn't do a, a specific count, but just looking at the number that we pulled together, I think we've got probably 25 or so. Um, so we've got a, a good number of, of, of crabs to show you. So you all, as we talk about them, feel free to come closer where you can see them. So maybe we'll start by showing the ones that people are likely familiar with. Um, so we've got, Brian, you want to help me pull together blue crab stuff? Sure. Um, so dried crabs and some crab molts just to show the potential size. Handling these live is a bit of a challenge as you can imagine. You probably have some experience with blue crabs. Look at those pinchers. So these are a little more friendly for hands-on presentations unless you want it to get really exciting. <laughs> they are delicious. In fact, their scientific name, Kalanectes sapidus, translates roughly to beautiful savory swimmer. Um, and they are swimming crabs. Um, while I grab the um, live one, Brian, you want to show the sure. swimmer heads? So the, the, find these adult blue crabs swimming along the surface out in the bay, and they're, they're using these paddles, sort of sculling as they go. And there are many um, cousins of the blue crab that have that same strategy and same, same body type. Um, and they don't get as large as the greater blue crab. The, yeah, there's, we also have a lesser blue crab um, that's one of our local species, um, and I, I, we don't have one, I don't think, to show you guys, but um, I do have a live juvenile, which I was just wrangling over there and out of a bucket, but I'm going to put that one down for a second, we'll come back to it, and, and maybe we can um, talk a little bit about the crab life cycle. Um, 
So this one, do we have a male? There's a female here, and we have a male here, and you can tell the difference. If you, if you like to eat boiled crabs, now you can tell whether you're eating a male or a female. It's always nice to have a little personal information about your food. Um, so this one is a male, and it has sort of a rocket-shaped... This part of the crab is actually, um, it's telson, so it's, a net, it's like its tail. So it's analogous to a crawfish tail or a shrimp tail. But in the adult form, they carry that tucked under their abdomens. So um, uh, they, look, they look different on the males and the females when they're adults. So this one's a male, looks kind of rocket shaped. And this one's a female, kind of looks like the dome of the Capitol building. And the females carry their eggs kind of under that plate. It, it acts sort of like an apron. And so this one is gravid. She has eggs, maybe up to a million eggs. In a, sometimes people call these um, sponge crabs, or they call that a sponge. And when the crabs first lay these eggs, they're a bright orange. So what would you associate orange and eggs with? Yolk, yeah. So you can actually see the yolk through the egg capsules when they first lay them. And then as the babies grow, so what is, what, what, what function does the yolk serve? Feed them. Yeah, it's nutrients for them. So they will use that yolk as they are growing inside those egg capsules. And so over time, the egg mass will get darker and darker. And the crab, the female crabs will carry those eggs until the babies hatch and then they will release the, the baby. So, you know, if you think about different reproductive strategies, some animals broadcast spawn where they just release sperms and eggs into the water. Some of them lay eggs and leave them. Um, so these crabs at least take care of the eggs. Um, so then after the babies hatch, they're on their own. And we... One neat thing about the color change too, it's not just the decrease in the yolk that turns them from orange to dark, the, what's increasing is the size of their eyes. So their eyes are very dark. So as the orange yolk decreases, the dark eyes get bigger and bigger. So when you see a, a dark sponge underneath the female crab, it, darkness is because of all those tiny crab baby eyes that are looking at it. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, ha we actually brought some larval, rounded up some of the larval crabs. So they go through a couple of different larval phases before they take on the um, like the morphology, the shape of an adult crab. They, they wouldn't be adults, but they have that body form. So this is a 3D printed zoea larva. So this is, you know, as Brian was describing, the large eyes. And you can see that tail there. So as they grow, they molt, they shed their exoskeletons. Um, you were mentioning having gotten some soft shell crabs to eat. So soft shell crabs are not a particular species of crab. They are crabs right after they molt, and we'll come back to that more in a minute. Um, but uh, they will shed that exoskeleton, and as they're going through this metamorphosis, um, they will change with those successive molts. So we have the first larval phase right here, 3D printed, much larger than size. I'm not sure what the scale is. But then we also have um, the next larval phase, which is, probably can't see that, that very well, but the name of it is Megalops, which means big eyes. So if you guys want to pass those around, if your eyesight's good enough, you might even be able to see them in there. If you give it a little swirl, you might be able to see some individually. Might be a little easier to make them out in there. <clears throat> and then... It's our version of the snow globe. So I went out to the <laughs> marsh this, uh, this morning to see if I could catch any little juvenile blue crabs. And I um, scooped this up. This is not a juvenile blue. This is not a dead crab. It's not a live crab. It's a conundrum. So what is it? It's not a dead crab. It's not a live crab. It's a molt. Oh. <laughs> it's a molt. So um, when crabs and other arthropods, so we're talking crabs, shrimp, um, 
lobsters, but also insects, scorpions, spiders, millipedes, centipedes, roly polies, all of these different animals, when they grow, they molt. They shed their exoskeletons. Mm -hmm. And so this is, it is a process of growth. I'm trying to lift that up back there, but um, the, they will grow a new exoskeleton inside the old one because they can't just leave the exoskeleton behind without having anything to you know, contain their, their body parts. Um, but the new one is bigger than the old one, but they want to leave the old one behind. So the new one has to be inside the old exoskeleton. So the new exoskeleton that they grow is soft. And then they will, yeah, so then they will, so that seam is split in the back and they'll kind of wiggle out of that um, old exoskeleton. And their new exoskeleton is soft for a day or so and they will sort of inflate it with water and then it hardens up and they have room to grow inside there. So when you get soft shell crabs, in our area, that's, that's almost exclusively going to be blue crabs. But somewhere else, if you're eating soft shell crabs, you may be eating a different species of crab that has just molted and is still soft. It's crazy, it's every body part is regenerated on the inside and is soft. So it's not just the, the shell, it's the, the legs, the covers of their eyes, their mouth parts. The gills is duplicated soft and then they back out of that old shell and then That's expand right. and every body part uh, hardens and uh, then they're a bigger version of their previous cells. If you could see this well enough, one of the ways that I can tell a molt when I pick up a crab like this is that the eye covering is clear. So, uh, or I, or you know, or I'll give you the, the opportunity to do the smell test on it. <laughs> if you'd like to try smelling it, um, if it doesn't smell like a, a rotting you know, animal, then, then it may be a molt. Uh, but if you can see those clear eye coverings, hmm. that's an indication that it's a molt rather than a dead crab. In the aquarium, that's a handy test. When you have what you might think is a dead crab, pick it up, smell it. If it doesn't smell, it's, oh, yeah. it's likely just the shed. Mm -hmm. But also does the eye coverings being clear is a neat thing to look for. So I do have a live juvenile. And I, you know, I catch an awful lot of juvenile crabs. Uh, and, I, and I pass them around to people to handle, little kids to handle. And um, so with a lot of experience, um, you know, I know that at a certain size, like, like this size right here, they're not likely to try to pinch. Although blue crabs are known for being, um, you know, they, uh, they defend themselves aggressively with their claws. But when they're babies, that's not a very effective defense because their claws are small. Um, and so uh, they're more likely to try to run and hide than pinch. But they get to a certain size. And at that size, just from a lot of experience hand handling crabs of a lot of different sizes, about that size when they start trying to defend themselves with their claws. So this one here um, is is big enough that I would predict that it would try to, um, you know, pinch for defense. But there is a way that you can handle blue crabs um, that, per, you know, that will keep them from pinching you. So you can hold them by their back legs, by their swimmerettes, and they're pretty good at climbing too. So this one is trying to climb out. I'll just let it. It's like those morning news cat okay. auction scenes where the cat goes crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Do they regenerate? Yeah, they can. When they lose it, correct. If uh, they, you know, with a successive molt, they can grow that back. Uh, now it might be smaller. Um, so another thing that I can point out to you from crab handling. So if you hold them by their back legs, their back swim rats, they cannot reach you to pinch. Um, but this little crab is holding onto this net. And if I wanted it to let go of the net, which I do, get some water there, I can dangle it over water. So if I let it hang, it'll let go. Well, like, it's, I think it's sort of untangling itself. Oops. 99 times out of 100. <laughs> it's going to make a liar out of me. Um, but we can... Maybe come back to that one if we want to. There's that shedding spider. Oops. Oh, there we go. We let go. So if anybody would like to take a closer look at that one, you can. Um, and in a little bit, if you want to, 
I'll even pull it out and let you hold it if you want, if anybody wants to. Um, so I also, when I found that little um, molt of the of the juvenile blue, I caught a little crab, a little swimming crab, that at first I thought was a baby blue crab. Um, and then on closer inspection, I realized that it's a different species, which I, in an awful lot of sampling in our local marshes, I don't recall ever having caught one of these before. Um, Brian is nodding his head in agreement. So this, I am relatively certain, is a purple swimming crab, which is also called an iridescent swimming crab. And so if you compare it to this molt of this blue crab, one of the distinctive characteristics that differentiates them as, as different species is you can see how much longer um, these claws are on this one, on the live one. And also, right back here, you can see these little purple dots on the tips of its swimmerettes, swimming paddles. And that one actually seems pretty comfortable in my hand. It's not neither trying to run away nor pinch me. It's just kind of calm. And that's a good example of another species that has the same body characteristics with those swimming paddles. And the purple iridescent swimming crab, we typically see farther offshore. But lately, the salinity right along the shore of Dauphin Island has been really high. Mm. I think some of that gulf water is coming in closer to shore and bringing some of these typically offshore animals uh, right, up, right up to the beach here. As they get bigger, it's easier to tell them apart from a blue crab. But mm -hmm. the purple is dramatic, mm -hmm. dramatic and bright. Yeah. Did you say what species is this one? This is a blue crab. That's a blue crab? Greater blue crab. Oh, it is. It's just mm -hmm. a small, small one. It just doesn't have the points on it's it? It's a juvenile. It saying. does. They're just obscured by the um, claws that are bent. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, and another species that I caught out there, kind of in the same place. These were in the water. These are water crabs, these swimming crabs. And these are fiddler crabs. Right. So these were right up on shore. Um, and and these were, were just you know, a few feet away in the water. So I've got both males and females in here, and they the get the name fiddler crabs. The, yeah. yeah, just just an hour ago or so. The males have one big claw and one small claw, and they feed on decaying organic matter that's mixed into the sediment, so part of the, that rich mud in the marsh. And the males do not use their big claws for that, so, um, kind of demonstrate for you. The big claw just sort of rests there while they shovel food into their mouths with their smaller claw, and it looks like they're playing a fiddle. So that's how they get the name fiddler crab. The females, though, have two, uh, their claws, oh, nope, that's a smaller male, but I do have a, a good size female in here. So the females do have two kind of, their claws are smaller and of the same size. So that one is a I like to describe crabs as either hiders or fighters, and the blue crabs will, you know, try to defend themselves by pinching once they get to a certain size. The fiddlers will try to run and hide. So I had to kind of cut my hands around them or kind of make them feel like they're secure. So this is a female, and Brian, can I hand her to you and I'll grab a male? Oops. Maybe. So they will try to run and hide. What's the purpose of the <laughs> it's it's a size display so they will wave that claw at the female to try to attract a mate <laughs> so in the, on the Gulf Shore itself where we take our grandkids and find fiddler crabs at night what do they eat now, are you, you may be catching uh, ghost crabs or sand crabs. Oh, maybe, oh, okay. So the fiddler crabs are found in the muddy marsh, okay. and then the ghost or sand crabs are found on our beaches, and a lot of people go out and collect those. Unfortunately, that was the one crab that I really wanted to catch to show uh, that I was unable to catch. They're mostly nocturnal, uh, so uh, they will come out in the morning, and also the smaller ones come out more often during the day. And I walked out to the beach this morning looking, and I saw one as soon as I walked out to the beach. But unfortunately, it was right at its burrow entrance, and I was unable to catch it, yeah. Um, but they are very opportunistic. Your question was about what they eat. So they will eat nearly anything that's edible that they can get to, they, including things that people leave on the beach, that 
things that dogs leave on the beach, um, dead fish that wash up. They will even build a burrow right next to a dead fish while they eat that carcass. Uh, so they're not picky eaters. <laughs> the ghost crabs aren't. Um, so we talked about blues, fiddlers. We talked about the ghost crabs, even though I didn't have one to show. Um, how about this? What? We talked about the purple swimming crabs. Well, what are we up to? Four species now? Um, also, just to quickly um, make a point, because this is one that people are familiar with, but they're not true crabs. So what scientists call true crabs. So at this point, maybe we talk about some language. Um, so I, I thought maybe we would do a little feature of crabs as a tie-in with um, uh, December because they have the same, the, so the group, the taxonomic group that crabs are in um, is Decapoda, which the, the deca part um, is 10, like a decade is 10 years. December is the 10th month of the year. <laughs> So actually, um, you know, with the, the, as the first Roman calendar was established, it was the 10th month of the year. So you've got November 9th, October 8th, and the September 7th, um, but the calendar year shifted. So it's no longer the 10 month, but that's why the, the roots of those months are that way. Um, so crabs are decapods. They have 10 legs, and they are in that group with shrimps and crawfish and lobsters and, and many others, but we decided to focus more closely on the crab um, diversity. However, these would not fall into the group that scientists um, consider to be true crabs. Uh, hermit crabs? So they are decapods, um, but not they're not brachyurin, so they're not um, in what scientists consider to be true crabs. So we also have um, horseshoe crabs around here, which I didn't pull out to show, but they are, they are not crabs either. Um, so we, ha we do have a couple of different species here. So I have um, the striped leg hermit crab, which is the one that you are likely to find from our beaches. And then these we catch a little bit offshore, the flat claw hermit crab or the broad claw hermit crab. Some of these animals would have multiple common names. And sometimes you'd have the same common name that would be used for different um, species. So there's some confusion with the, the common names. All right, so those not true crabs. And then we pulled out a few from um, the aquarium to share some of the you know, diversity. And these are crabs that we, you know, we catch when we go offshore trawling. So if you have ever been on one of our boat trips, trawling trips, you, um, you know, might have caught some of these. So the ones that people are more familiar with are typically the ones that are found closer to shore, where they can go out with net, walk out with nets. Um, the marsh is a little less accessible. Not as many people will, you know, wade out into the muddy marsh looking for crabs. Um, but some some people are familiar with the fiddlers because they'll crawl around in the, you know, tidal ditches around here. So this crab right here, that is often confused with fiddler crabs, is called a wharf crab or a squareback crab. Uh huh. And you can see. Let me grab one of the fiddlers if I can figure out which bucket they're in. A lot of buckets here. Okay. Um, if you want to grab that one, we can compare them. So the shape of the carapace of the fiddler crab is a little more barrel shaped, while that one is more square. So they um, kind of live in, in, they both live in the marsh. The, the squarebacks will live in other places too, but um, they can be found in the same habitats and they look a lot alike. And so they're sometimes confused. But the squareback or the wharf crab has a very square carapace um, and a more flat body, more flat legs. And the fiddler has a kind of a more barrel shaped. So the fiddler body. crab digs burrows and hides down the burrows. So they're, they are more barrel shaped and they fit right down in those holes. Mm -hmm. The wharf crab or the squareback tends to hide under. Uh, driftwood logs and debris that's along the, the shoreline. So mm -hmm. they're, they're very flattened instead of being barrel shaped because they wedge themselves underneath uh, pieces of wood or uh, 
vegetation in the marsh. So often these morphological differences, the differences in their body forms, you know, um, can be explained by their life, you know, their, the differences in the way they, they live and the, the niches that they inhabit. So the swimming crabs, you know, are water crabs. Um, and we've got, I mean, they, you know, they, they swim. They do hang, out, hang around on the bottom, so they will bury themselves like in a sandy bottom or a muddy bottom. But then we've got a, one of the species of spider crabs that we have locally, and we have multiples. Ooh. So this spider crab, is it's behaving, a, you want to handle it? It's behaving a little bit different. I thought it might hold on, which is one of the things that they kind of typically do. But this one is so used to being handled, um, it's you know, exhibiting different behavior than they do, uh, you know, when I catch them out off the boat and they, they, you know, they just behave a little differently if you're just pulling them out of a net versus you're pulling them out of a tank where they've been kept in captivity. Um, so <laughs> often when you catch these, they will um, kind of be still. This one's very active, but sometimes they will be still and um, kind of hide and these crabs will also um, pick things up like shells or bits of um, algae or um, bryozoa and kind of stick them to their backs and sort of camouflage themselves and hide. So this one is being very active but it is it is accustomed to being handled and fed. So Brian if you want to take it. Somewhere along the line, can you talk about what the predators of the various crabs are? Well, a lot of things like to eat crabs. So the various crabs are? Well, a lot of things like to eat crabs. So besides humans? Yeah, a lot of things besides humans. Octopus <laughs> like to eat crabs. Besides humans? Yeah, a lot of things besides humans. Octopus <laughs> like to eat crabs? One, one relatively easy way as a scuba diver to find where an octopus is hiding is to look for a little cave with a pile of shells and crab carapaces uh -huh. because the octopus loves to eat those and he'll pile them up. The octopus will pile them up right around the outside of the cave like, thinking it's helping to camouflage it. But <laughs> for us, we're, we can recognize that that's where the octopus is hiding out. And it's, it's neat. I don't know if you can see uh, the mouth parts. The, all of these crabs have multiple pairs of mouth parts that work uh, to process the food that they eat. Some of them are slightly different because of what they eat. Uh, like like the, the ones that are primarily herbivores or plant eaters will have different grinding mm -hmm. mouth parts for that, uh, different than the carnivorous crabs. But they all have multiple pa pairs of mouth parts that are uh, reminiscent of some, some good Halloween, I mean, not Halloween, but uh, horror movie animals. Monsters. So yeah, I think some horror movie monsters have been based on crab mouth parts. But if you notice the way I handled that crab, I did not bother trying to avoid the, the claws on it. Um, where with this one, you know, I was holding it by its back legs, um, you know, even though it is actually a lot smaller than that spider crab, because if you look at the, they're just not as likely to try to pinch. It is not, uh, not very effective as a defense. It's not one that they are as likely to use. So look at how skinny those legs are, they, even their, their claws. They don't have a lot of muscle in there for pinching. The claws look like uh, horseshoe crab claws. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, they're good at picking, but they're, they're not very strong. So some, a, a lot of people just kind of think of crabs and they think, you know, th those animals pinch. It's like the first, an first thing they think about when they think about crabs. But not all of them are, you know, likely to, to pinch you when you handle them. So we also have one in here, one that, that I, um, this was kind of what I thought it might do when I first picked it up, where it's kind of wrapping its uh, long legs, its long walking legs around my hand. Um, so that is what I have experienced with a lot of spider crab handling, is that they kind of, they want to wrap onto something and hold on to it, it you know. And, so I'll try to gently pull it off of my so hand more detail about the spider crab. and wrist. This is one of our three local species. Um, I've seen this species with just the carapace, which is just the back, not the legs, but our local species can get about this big around. Mm -hmm. There's a species in the uh, Western Pacific, 
the Japanese giant spider crab. Mm -hmm. And they can get about, leg span, about 14 feet across. They're huge. They weigh about 40 pounds. I remember many, many years ago, I saw a photograph of one, and I thought it was like a doctored photograph, that it was not real, that it was some, you know, uh, trick. Um, one of the ones that, that I forgot to mention is one of our little inshore crabs that can be found around here, but that people may not be familiar with because they're really good at hiding and maybe people don't venture into the um, ecosystems where they can be found. This is a mud crab. And we find these hiding around oyster reefs um, or some kind of structure. And if you look at the size of these claws, for their size, they actually have a good bit of muscle in there. So, you know, we wouldn't always assume necessarily that just because they are, they have strong claws that they are likely to pinch. Because these guys kind of, when you are handling them, they kind of go into like rock mode. Where they just sort of curl up and pretend not to be a living thing, I think. Um, so, you know, they, it could pinch. And if it did, it might hurt a little bit. But my, in my experience handling these, they are not that likely to pinch. And sometimes if people do see these, they can be confused with, um, got it here, stone crabs. So this guy also can pinch, and as you can see, it's got muscular claws, and it would hurt if it pinched. Um, but they're just not as likely to use those claws as a defense as the blue crabs are. Oh, you want to pull that one out for comparison? So those are found around here as well? Mm -hmm. They are. Um, so the little mud crabs look a lot like juvenile stone crabs. Um, so you can see that the sort of the body form of them is similar. And typically the mud, uh, stone crabs, excuse me, have these dark tips on their claws. And... Um, Around here, there's not a, a big enough population really to support a commercial fishery for them like there is down in Florida. Mm -hmm. But we do find them here a uh, fair amount. And sometimes we find them really large. There are a couple of claws in the tray over there. Mm. So um, the big claw, small claw is true for fiddlers. It's not true for all crabs, but it's true for fiddler crabs. And stone crabs also have a big claw, small claw. So the big claw is more for crushing um, their food. They'll eat shellfish. And then the smaller claw they can use to pick, pick the meat out of the crushed shellfish. So in places where they are harvested, sometimes the regulations are that the larger claw or a claw can be taken and, and you know that would usually be the larger claw. And if they lose that claw, they can regenerate with the next molt, but their, their, their next claw will be smaller. And that assumes that they survive until their next molt. It's interesting that there's some uh, animal differentiations where they modify body parts that are based on mating, like the, the fiddler crab. As he's, he likes to show off that big claw to attract the females and other animals, the differentiation is for function, for, for feeding. So like the, the stone crab here, where you have one claw for crushing and the other claw for delicate picking. Yeah, so that's true for the males and the females. Um, and then we have a couple of other live crabs. So, you're welcome to sit right over here. Oh, oh, it's gonna be lively. <laughs> now it's gonna go back into rock mode. All right, so this crab is called a calico crab. And if you want to hold that one, I'll pull the preserved one over to you. So that one is alive. And here's a larger one that is preserved. So these live in the water, and they're found a little bit offshore. We don't commonly find these. The stone crabs we can find just from, you know, from walking out into our waters. You can find them without a boat. Blue crabs, mud crabs, fiddler crabs, the ghost crabs. Hermit crabs, too, even though they're not really crabs. Um, so most of the 
ones we have talked about, and, and I did find the purple swimming crab just right off of our shore, although that's not typical. Um, but then, then we'll show some of these crabs that are a little bit offshore where we typically find them trawling rather than just going out in the water and using nets, uh, like dip nets or seine nets. There's a, a whole group of crabs that use their claws not just for feeding, but also for defense, um, the calico, and then even more so with what's called the yellow box crab. You can see they, they have very tall claws and they can pull them up right in front of their face because those mouth parts are pretty delicate, so it helps to protect that. It's like a, a shield that they can use. So it, does, it, it doesn't care to be on its back like this. It's more vulnerable that way. So it would like for me to turn it over, but I was trying to show those claws. Oh, and it's got me a little bit. Let's see if I can get it to let go. So it let go when I, so that's handy, you know, if you're handling crabs, it's handy to know that they will usually let go um, if you dangle them over water. Um, so we also have a preserved yellow box crab. These are also called shame-faced crabs. So another common name of this is a shame-faced crab. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. And then here's another species of box crab here. So what are the markings on the carapace remind you of? Tiger. Tiger or maybe something on fire? <laughs> so this is called the flame box crab. Oh. And again, it has those really tall pincher, pincher arms oh, out up yeah. front to help protect it. Yeah. There's one there. Uh, claw. And these have differentiated claws as well for feeding. Um, they feed a, a fair amount on uh, snails, and they can use these strong and hooked claws like a can opener. They can actually crack the shell of the snail. Wow. When the snail pulls inside its shell to hide and mm -hmm. to protect mm -hmm. itself, this guy just cracks the shell open. Yeah. And it has the delicate pinchers to push out the, the meat to eat it. So this is another uh, oh, swimming grab. The, yeah, they're very delicate at that point. It's just... Um, damaged it. This is, uh, you can see the swimmerettes on this one. So this one is a lady crab. It's called a lady crab. So related to the blue crabs and the purple swimming crabs. Um, and then we've got another one of the swimming crabs over there preserved. And it's hard to see the coloration in that because it, they, the, the preservation um, kind of takes color out of them sometimes. But that one is camouflaged to live in sargassum. So that's a sargassum crab. And then we've got a... So they just float around the surface all hang the on time. to the floating seaweed. Yeah. They mm -hmm. don't go down. They don't, yeah, they don't. Mm -hmm. So this one is called a yellow line arrow crab. It's so little. Mm-hmm. We also have a false arrow crab. We don't have one on hand, but we, they're fairly common locally. This one is a sponge crab. And we have a, a spider crab. Brian mentioned it um, when we were talking about molting. But this one is mid-molt. So you can see it is, this one had started backing out of its old exoskeleton and it has the new exoskeleton there. Sometimes when the crabs have nutrient deficiencies, they're not able to perform that uh, complex task successfully and they sometimes get hung up. The, mm. the new part that they've made on the inside of their old shell gets hung up on the old shell and, and they don't survive the process. It's, a, a it must really be tricky to get those long skinny legs out. Exactly. And it's just a time where where these yeah. species are really vulnerable. The process of molting is leaves them vulnerable, but also the result when they're soft for a day or so. 
and they're really vulnerable to predators. So this one is called um, an elbow crab. That's another one of the crabs that's found in Alabama waters. You can see um, how long the, uh, the claws are. Um, and then we've got the, the giant um, Caribbean land crab which has been found on Dauphin Island a few times. Um, we've found them on Dauphin Island a few times. Typically, um, maybe after a hurricane. And so there's not a, that we know of, there's not a population that, that lives here long, long term. But they have been found here. So um, very large terrestrial um, they're coastal, but terrestrial crabs. That's an interesting point, too, about uh, development among different crab species. The, many of these crabs that we're familiar with are live 100% of their life in the water. And you move farther up onto the shore, you've got the, like the um, mud crabs that are right along the oyster reefs, and then the fiddler crabs and the wharf crabs are at the water's edge. They go in and out of the water. But then things like the Caribbean land crab... And ghost um, crabs. And the ghost crabs aren't dependent on being in the water. They need access to water periodically, but they're able to, to keep their gills moist. And that's really the, the issue with it is their gills. Um, mm -hmm. Similar to fish, crabs breathe, they extract oxygen mm -hmm. from their surroundings uh, with their gills. So the land crab is able to keep his gills moist and travel inshore and be out of the water for days, uh, but mm -hmm. still, still survive. So just different different adaptations for different lifestyles. And this one here, a different swim, it's a molt from a different swimming crab too, and it's not in great shape because, um, you know, we keep molts to show, um, but, you know, that they, they don't hold up that well. So this one here, so I won't try to move it, but um, I think that is a, is it a blotched yeah, swimming, swimming crab? crab? can be hard to tell from the, when they're preserved or when they're, you know, you're looking at a molt. But so, how, but how long, you know how long it is to take when they molt to get out of the shell, start to finish kind of thing, not the well, hardening of the, the shell. From the point that that back place opens up and they start to back out, it's mm -hmm. normally minutes, tens mm -hmm. of minutes, 10, 15, mm -hmm. 20 minutes maybe. Um, then how long does it take for them to actually harden once they're out of the shell? Well, I'm not sure if there's variation among the species, but for blue crabs, I think it's, you know, a day or maybe a little bit longer than that. But um, one of the interesting things about that molting process, too, is that it's when the females are soft at their adult um, phase where they um, mate and, and lay eggs. And the males will actually, so she is in a soft state. And the males will actually wrap their bodies around the soft females and um, defend them as their shells harden up, um, you know, before the females. The females will then go offshore and this um, larval phases will drift around as plankton. And then when they take on that, so this is, you know, it's, it's not an adult, but it does have that adult form um, in that metamorphosis and so then they will settle in our salt marshes so we catch a lot of of baby blue crabs in our salt marshes um, so I don't know how many different species of crabs we have here but it's a it's a pretty good sample and all of these all of these crabs that we've shown you were collected locally so either Ryan or I caught them, or they were caught in our, um, you know, Sea Lab trawling trips. So we, you know, we collect animals for, for various reasons here at the Sea Lab, sometimes for education. So I will often take people out into the field to the beach, you know, or out into the marsh or out on trawling trips, and we collect a lot of crabs. Some of them we look at and we release. Some of them we might bring for exhibit in the aquarium. Um, and we have, you know, other educational programs that do the same thing. Sometimes Brian um, and the aquarist staff goes out collecting 
Um, sometimes the researchers go out and they collect our stone crab was came out of a research project. We'll go and put it right back into the the um, basket where he had it set up in an experiment. We took it with permission. Um, <laughs> And uh, sometimes um, animals are collected to form part of a, um, you know, a, a collection in order to show some of these species that we, um, you know, the ones that we don't catch every day, but that are present in our water. So we have some of them preserved in order to study. So, um, you know, if you guys have any questions about any of these, and you're welcome to come and take a closer look. Some of them are really, really delicate, um, but others are pretty robust for handling. Uh, or we, we, you know, we are able to collect enough of them that we're happy for kids and for visitors to take a closer look at them and, and kind of study them a little closer. Thank you. And thanks for...